আমার আজকে যে লেকচার সেটার টাইটেল হচ্ছে বঙ্গবন্ধুস ভিশন অফ সেকুলারিজম ফর বাংলাদেশ এবং এখন যে লিখিত যে লেকচার যেটা কালকে রাত্রে আমি বাউন ভাবে এশিয়াটিক সোসাইটি থেকে আমার বাসায় পৌঁছে দেওয়া হয়েছে সেটা পেলাম এশিয়াটিক সোসাইটিকে এত তাড়াতাড়ি এটা করার জন্য অনেক ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি সাল রিড আউট ফ্রম মাই রিটার্ন লেকচার throughout his life bangobandhu sheikh mujibur rahman was guided by the ideals of nationalism secularism democracy and socialism ideals that were later enshrined in the bangladesh constitution as fundamental principles of the state his political ideals and goals are quite explicitly expressed in the three books that have been published based on his diaries these books the unfinished memoirs prison diaries and amar dekha noya king narrate part of uh, parts of his life story as well as articulate his personal beliefs and ideals his speeches have also been compiled and published they illuminate our understanding of the core principles of his life so i have used both three of his own writings plus some of the compilation of his speeches throughout uh, his life bangobandhu's idealism was not theoretical or based simply on reading of books he was a man of action whose ideals were inspired by the real life experiences of ordinary people his politics was people's politics he was cognizant of identity groups based on language ethnicity and religion but he did not try to create division and hatred between different identity groups he perceived the nationalist movement not simply as a struggle to gain independence from the rule of an external colonial power but also as a struggle for the establishment of a democratic state and a just and equitable socio economic order আমার মনে হয় যে এই যে বঙ্গবন্ধুর আইডিয়া অব ন্যাশনালিজম এটা আমাদের একটু খানা আজকে যে সমস্ত কন্ট্রোভার্সি হচ্ছে আমরা যে রকমের ন্যাশনালিস্ট মুভমেন্ট দেখছি যেটা হচ্ছে যে অন্যান্য গ্রুপের প্রতি একটা হেটরেট করা এবং শুধু সেই ধরনের কখনোই ছিল না উনি পাকিস্তান মুভমেন্ট এবং তারপরে আমরা যখন বাংলাদেশ সেটাও দেখি সেটা আমি দেখি যে সবসময় এক্সটার্নাল কলোনিয়াল পাওয়ারের থেকে মুক্তি চাচ্ছে কিন্তু তার সঙ্গে যে জনগণের একটা মুক্তির পার্টিকুলারলি পুয়োর পেসেন্স এটা সেই পাকিস্তান আন্দোলনের সময় দেখছি বাংলাদেশ আন্দোলনের সঙ্গে দেখছি অতএব এই যে দ্যাট ইউ আর কগনিজেন্ট অব আইডেন্টিটি but this identity does not mean that you are trying to uh, be against any other identity groups a point amar mone hoy bangobondhur ideas of nationalism jokhon amra bhabi we should remember that in an earlier article i have analyzed the major elements of bangobondhus political philosophy uh, this article was published uh, in two international um, uh, journals and a book and also parts of it was published in a um, local uh, newspapers in uh, today i will focus on only one of his ideals his thoughts on secularism i will draw on his life experiences writings and speeches to explore his perspective on secularism the article is organized in four sections following the introduction i discuss his early political initiation when he was only a school student he was inspired by swadeshi movement and its message of anti colonialism at the same time bangobandhu was drawn to the pakistan movement however all along he believed in hindu muslim communal harmony He argued that both Hindus and Muslims should be able to live as equal citizens in Pakistan and India. In the next section I discussed the evolution of his political life after the creation of Pakistan. How gradually he became disenchanted with the new state, became a strong champion of Bengali nationalism and a strong proponent of secular politics. The concluding section analyzes how after the birth of Bangladesh some of the dimensions of secularism Bangobandhu propagated all through his life were re- were reflected in the Bangladesh constitution and his various political policy measures 
So uh, let me, uh, the first section is on his political initiation, where I subtitled it as self-rule Pakistan movement and non-communal politics. Bangabundu became interested in politics at a young age when he was a high school student in Gopal Ganj. In his unfinished memoirs, he writes about his exposure to the Swadeshi movement in the 1930s, when he was a mere teenage boy. The movement's ideals of self-rule left a lifelong imprint on Bangabundu's political philosophy. He became an admirer of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bosch, attended meetings of his party, and started, as he wrote in his memoirs, mixing with the people in the Swadeshi movement. He further notes, I began to harbor negative ideas about the British in my mind. The English, I felt, had no right to stay in our country. We had to achieve independence. His interest in Muslim League politics was, however, kindled by his meeting with Hussein Shahid Surawardi, who came on a visit to uh, Gopal Ganj in 1939. Bangabandhu started uh, writing letters to Surawardi and came into regular contact with him when he was enrolled in Islamia College, Kolkata. Uh, in 19, I think it will be 42. I, uh, there is a, uh, a typo here. During 42-47, he became active in the uh, organizational work of the Muslim Students League and the Muslim League. Within the Muslim League, he was a supporter of the Surawardi Abul Hashim group, who were known as the progressives within the party. Here I mentioned his initiation with the Shadeshi movement, because I think that this throughout, if you read his unfinished memoir, uh, we find that he actually remained all along, even when he was involved in Pakistan movement, he was remained all along an admirer of Netaji Shubhash Bosch. So this anti-colonial struggle, that feel, feeling of self-rule, I think that was uh, very, very deep in his uh, mind. So that uh, this, uh, I think, would, uh, this sense of uh, uh, anti-colonial struggle uh, is a continuing theme from his teenage years all through his life. Bangabandhu joined the Pakistan movement as he writes in his unfinished memoirs. He was proud of both his Muslim identity and his Bengali identity. He writes, uh, we Bengali Muslims have two sides. One is our belief that we are Muslims and the other that we are Bengalis. Bangabandhu believed that Pakistan should be established on the basis of the Lahore Resolution, which in envisages two Muslim majority independent sovereign states. While campaigning for Pakistan, he invariably invoked the Lahore Revolution and talked about two Pakistans, one that is comprising Bengal and Assam, and another in the West, comprising Punjab, in Belgistan and the Frontier province. Bangabandhu was a fervent supporter of the Pakistan movement, but he did not believe in democracy nor was he ever moved by the argument that Pakistan needed to, to save Islam. He believed that during colonial rule, Muslims as a community had been deprived and excluded and they needed to be freed from all types of oppression. He joined the Pakistan movement in the hope that the poor Muslim peasants would be liberated from the exploitation of the landlord and leading classes. He talks that Hindu and Muslims landlords have oppressed the poor Muslim peasants, as well as poor Hindu peasants. In his unfinished memoirs, Bongo lamented about the misguided politi uh, politics of Hindu and Muslim leaders who failed to speak up for the oppressed and exploited peasants and instead fueled in communal divide. Uh, I'm quoting from him. Uh, he, if these selfless, freedom-loving, and dedicated Hindus had attempted to promote Hindu Muslim unity while carrying on the movement to drive out the British and had stood up against the rapacious Hindu landlords and moneylenders who were oppressing the Muslims, perhaps the bitterness between the communities would have been contained. Of the Hindu leaders, only Deshbandhu, Chitaranjosh, and had understood the importance of such jails and 
had often cautioned Hindus against their prejudices. Rabindranath Tagore had also warned the Hindus about through his writings. But it was also true uh, that Muslim leaders had been treating their Hindu tenants shabbily. However, they oppressed them as their landlords and not because of their religion. At that time, we saw that whenever a Muslim leader spoke up for the rights of Muslims, many Hindus, including educated ones and even the brightest of them, would raise their voices in anger. Similarly, even before they spoke for Pakistan, Muslim leaders would preface their speeches by abusing Hindus. You can see that all along, uh, always uh, his uh, uh, belief that really the poor people, the, the sense of exploitation, oppression of the poor by the uh, ruling classes of of both communities uh, that they did that uh, and they used uh, re their own uh, religious religion as an instrument to spread hatred. I think that idea was all, all along very explicit in Bangabandhu's writings. While actively campaigning for Pakistan, Bangabandhu also worked for maintaining Hindu-Muslim community. He believed that both Hindus and Muslims should live in India and Pakistan with equal rights as citizens. He writes, both communities would be given equal rights. Hindus could live as citizens in Pakistan, just as Muslims could live freely in India. The Muslims would embrace the Hindus who lived with them as brothers, just as the Hindus of India would with the Muslims who lived amongst them. Bangabun witnessed the Hindu-Muslim communal riots in Kolkata on August 16, 1946. The carnage left a deep imprint in his mind. In his unfinished memoirs, Bangabundu writes extensively about the Kolkata riots when people from both communities engaged in violence. However, he also noted that some Hindus and some Muslims rose above their communal loyalties and saved each other during the riots. He himself saved both Muslims and Hindus from acts of communal violence. He describes his experiences in the following way. I quote from uh, his memoirs. I helped in rescuing stranded Muslims. In one or two places, I came under attack while trying to help in this part. We also rescued Hindus whenever possible and had them saved with Hindu localities. It was obvious that people had lost their human sides in the violence and had of, uh, and regressed to their animals' selves. On 16th August, the Muslims had taken a beating. The next two days, the Muslims beat up the Hindus mercilessly. The hospital figures were proof of the fatalities and injuries sustained by communities, by both communities on these days. So, if you read Bangabandhu, you see that repeatedly he talks about both communities engaging in violence and really uh, always emphasizing on the uh, humanity uh, that we should uh, uh, focus on. So it was not that he was sort of being one-sided uh, about it. Uh, uh, so he was speaking really the truth. In addition to being opposed to communal violence, Bangabundu was also opposed to misinterpretation of religion and its misuse for promoting partisan and political interests. So in terms of a secularism, I find his, uh, in terms of his message, one is this uh, no violence and non-communal uh, communal harmony. The other is use of religion or misuse of religion, particularly by religious so-called religious leaders. Pages and pages uh, of Bangabandhu's writings, you find these messages. Uh, in Amar Dekha Noyachin, he describes how before the referendum in Silet in 1946, he found many Maulanas who were paid money by the Congress party campaigning against Pakistan. Mm -hmm. The Maulanas were quoting Quran and Hadith to justify their position. 
in seeking an explanation for the misuse of Quran and Hadith by these Maulanas, Bangabundu writes, why do they, these Maulanas, do this? They do it because it is a business for them. So that is his view of this political use of uh, religion by many of the religious leaders. Mm -hmm. And this, you can see this kinds of quotes in you know, all of his uh, uh, diaries and all of his books. After the establishment of Pakistan, when he was leaving Kolkata, Sarawaddi advised Bangabandhu to continue his work for Hindu-Muslim communal harmony so that Hindus would not migrate from East Bengal to West Bengal. Sarawaddi told him, when you go back to your country, try to ensure communal harmony. If there is trouble in East Bengal, it will be catastrophic. Try to ensure that Hindus don't flee Pakistan. If they are forced to come here, they will start up trouble and that will result in an exodus of Muslims to East Bengal. If all the Muslims of Bengal, Bihar and Assam leave for East Bengal, you will not be able to accommodate so many people. It is quite clear from his writings that by the time he came to Pakistan in September 1947, Bangabandhu already developed strong feelings against Hindu-Muslim communal violence and misuse of religion as an instrument of politics. These positions were further consolidated after he came to Pakistan. Then my next section is titled Political Maturity, Bengali Nationalism and Secular Politics. This is his politics after 1947. Soon after coming to Pakistan, Bangabandhu started becoming disenchanted with the direction of the country's policies and politics. He found that a small privileged group of people were centralizing power in their hands to further their own vested interests instead of working to uplift the conditions of the masses. The ruling elites were also adopting policies against the political, economic, and cultural interests of the Bengalis against, um, furthermore, they were using Islam as a political instrument to justify their repressive and unjust policies. Bangabandhu realized the need to organize the progressive youths to resist feudal and democratic elements who control the state machinery. He already knew many of the student and youth lead leaders who, like him, belonged to the Surawad de Hashim faction of the Muslim League and were also getting concerned about the political developments in Pakistan. Following Surawad de's advice, initially he took up the cause of building Hindu Muslim communal harmony as his main mission. He was enrolled as a student of law in Dhaka University and became associated with the Democratic Youth League, League which was composed of non-communal progressive young activists. But soon disagreement arose between him and other members. As Bangabundu writes in his memoirs, he wanted the Youth League to act as a non-communal cultural organization with the sole purpose of promoting communal harmony, but others wanted to expand the organization's activities to a variety of issues covering the political arena. Bangabandhu then founded a new student organization to counter the activities of the already existing Muslim League's Student Front, All East Pakistan Muslim Students League. He called his new organization East Pakistan Muslim Students League, which was formed in January 1948. Though some of the young progressive activists opposed keeping Muslim in the name of the organization, Bangabandhu took a practical and gradual approach to the issue. He felt that time has not come for such change in name. He writes, if we hold on to our principles, we could change the name at a later date. It will take some time to change the mindset of the people and from, turn them away from the mindset that had made them participate in the movement for Pakistan. Again, I think this is say, another uh, quality of Bangabandhu that we find all through his political uh, life. That he had ideas and he held on to this core principle, but he was a very uh, pragmatic practicing politician. So that sometimes 
he would try to find some ground, ground to bring lots of people on the same platform without giving his core principles. But he may then, for instance, in the terms of the name, he thought it is best to keep Muslim at this stage. So that timing and when to do what, uh, Bangabundu had a very uh, superb sense of legal timing in terms of strategy. Uh, and this, I think, becomes very clear when you uh, go through the different steps and the graduated approach that he took step by step when he took the people along uh, with him when people are ready. So I think this interaction between him and the people, uh, I think that is also a very uh, important thing for us to remember. Within a month of founding the Students League, Bongabundu got involved in the Bengali language movement. In February 1948, Muslim leaders in the Constituent Assembly declared their intention to make Urdu the sole state language of Pakistan. The students of Dhaka University immediately protested. Bangabundu was arrested on 11 March 1948 while demonstrating in front of the Secretariat building demanding recognition of Bengali as a state language. The first of many such acts in the hands of Pakistan government. During 1948-49, in addition to the language movement, Bangabundu was also involved in other movements related to the struggles to improve the socio-economic conditions of the poor, such as protests against the cordon system, which prohibited inter-district movement of food. In 49, he became involved in the movement of the fourth class employees of Dhaka University for higher wages and was again imprisoned. The Pakistan government's response to these demands was repression, an attempt to malign the progressive political activists, calling them either Indian agents or anti-Islamic or communists. Bengali language and culture was branded as being under Hindu influence and not being Islamic enough by some of the Muslim League leaders. Bangabundu gradually became convinced about the need to form an opposition political party. On June 23, 1949, East Pakistan Army Muslim League was founded and Bangabundu was elected the joint secretary of the party, though he was still in prison. He notes in his memoirs that he was personally in favor of giving a non-communal title to the party. But again, he was a political realist and accepted the decision to keep Muslim in the name of the party. He writes, and I quote from him, it was my view that since Pakistan has been achieved, there was no further reason to create a political organization tied to ideals. I was for a non-communal party based on sound manifesto. In the end, I decided that the time had not yet come for such an organization. Perhaps those who had devised the East Pakistan Army Muslim League had created it after thinking over all the issues involved. Soon after the formation of the East Pakistan Army Muslim League, Bangabundu was released from prison, but within a few months, he was again imprisoned and was kept in prison for over two years without a charge under the Public Security Act. He was finally released on February 28, 1952. While he was in prison, Hindu-Muslim communal riots broke out both in India and in East Bengal in 1950. In his memoirs, Bangabundu expresses his strong disapproval of communal riots and his human interpretation of religion. And here again, I quote from Bangabundu. And all these quotations I have used because you find repeatedly uh, he uh, is stating that you cannot kill people in the name of religion. Uh, so here I quote from him. Many, and he is also very even-handed. He talks about both Muslims doing this, Hindus doing this. So I quote from him. Many innocent Muslims in Calcutta and equally innocent Hindus in Dhaka and Borishal died in the riots. Many people were arrested and brought to Dhaka jail. I tried to tell the jailed ones that it was not right to get involved in rioting and the killing of people. It was in fact a sin to kill innocent people. A true Muslim could not kill anyone who was blameless. God and prophet had forbidden such action. 
God has created Hindus as well as us. They deserve to be treated as human beings too. Just because some Hindus in India were involved in heinous actions did not mean that we should be perpetrating violence here. Again, this was this kind of message all through, even in 64, I mean, this, this is lifelong continuous message. Bangabandhu stood not only against Hindu-Muslim communal violence, but against all forms of communal violence between different Muslim sects and between Bengalis and non-Bengalis. -Beng non in his memoirs, he strongly condemns the anti kadiani riots that took place in Lahore in 1953. He describes his faith in tolerance and non-violence in the following way. Again, I'm quoting from his uh, memoirs. I know at least this much, that no one should be murdered because he holds views different from mine. That certainly was not what Islam taught and such an action was tantamount to a crime in the religion. Let alone Qadianis, Islam forbids punishing even non-believers. Pakistan was supposed to be a democracy. Here people of all faith, irrespective of race and religion, were supposed to have equal rights." In 1954, when communal riots broke out between Bengali and non-Bengali workers in Adamji jute mills in Naranganj, Bangabandhu immediately rushed to the area to calm the situation. Bangabandhu looked upon communal violence as a divide and rule strategy of the ruling classes to perpetuate their optation. In Amardekha Noya Chin, he discusses at some length how every religion, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism had been misinterpreted and misused by oppressive rulers to create divisions within and between religious communities to instigate violence and war. He writes, this is from Amar Dekhanoachin, and I'm quoting. It is the rule of the oppressive rulers to create divisions amongst the people so that their rule can be perpetrated. Whenever oppressed masses start a movement demanding their rights for food and clothing, oppressive rulers begin instigating one community against the other. Unfortunately, the oppressed people then forget their own demands and instead get involved in communal violence against each other." End of quote. During 1953-54, Bangabandhu was building the organizational strength of the EPAML. In 1953, he was elected the general secretary of the party and remained in that position till 1966 when he was elected as the party's president. In 1954, in East Bengal Provincial Assembly elections, the ruling Muslim League was routed by the opposition Electoral Alliance Jukta Front, of which the Awami League was the major partner with 143 out of 223 seats won by the Jukta Front candidates. Bangabandhu was elected to the Provincial Assembly and sworn in as a minister, but the ministry was dismissed by the central government within 90 days and he was again imprisoned. In 1955, Bangabandhu was elected to the National Assembly of Pakistan. The same year, the East Pakistan Army Muslim League dropped the word Muslim from its title, thus proclaiming its secular character. The party also came out in support of the joint electorate comprising both Hindu and Muslim voters. The rejection of separate electorate for Hindus and Muslims was a major step forward in the gradual process of assertion of Bengali secular national identity. By mid-1950s, Bangabandhu was already emerging as the leading champion of the Bengali nationalist movement and secular politics. In various speeches delivered in the National Assembly, he strongly articulated his non-communal positions and faith in equal rights of all citizens, irrespective of religion. And then I'm quoting a number of his speech, speeches that he gave uh, in 1955 as a member of the National Assembly of Pakistan. So for example, he opposed the proposal to name Pakistan an Islamic Republic. He argued, quote, if you declare that your country is an Islamic Republic, at once, minorities become second-class citizens. At least I feel so. 
and my conscience tells me it is against the fundamentals of Islam. Then he cautioned, again in the speech in um, uh, National Assembly, have you ever imagined what would be there, that is Muslims in India fate, if you declare Pakistan an Islamic Republic of Pakistan? The fanatic Hindus such as RSS and might agitate tomorrow for declaring India a Hindu Republic of India, for taking revenge on those unfortunate four crore of the Muslims of India who have sacrificed everything for the achievement of Pakistan, end of quote. Bangabandhu rejected the proposal for a separate electorate, arguing that only in South Africa such an apartheid system existed, that all other countries, including yeah. Muslim majority ones, such as Indonesia and others, operated on the basis of joint electorate. He also underscored the economic rationale for the creation of Pakistan. And again, in the um, assembly, he said that uh, Muslims wanted Pakistan not on the question of religion, but on the question of economy. Because the Muslims in India were poor, they wanted safeguard for their minorities, and they wanted a homeland. In 1958, the military dictator Field Marshal Ayub Khan took over power in Pakistan, and Bangabandhu was again imprisoned. Political activities were banned. Following Sarawadji's death in 1963, Bangabandhu reactivated the Awami League in 1964. In the same year, when Hindu-Muslim communal riots broke out in India, he started a civic campaign to resist communal riots in East Bengal and succeeded in preventing spread of violence. We all know about uh, his campaign, Purova Bangla, Rukia Dara. In 1966, Bangabandhu presented his historic six point demands, which put forward a very radical notion of autonomy for East Bengal, leaving only two subjects, defense and foreign affairs, the central government. Six points captured the aspirations of the masses and was built as a charter for the national liberation of the Bengalis. Following the launch of the Six Point Movement, Bangabandhu was again imprisoned and later in 68, while still in prison, he was charged with prison by the Pakistan government in the Agartala conspiracy case. The rising tide of Bengali nationalism, which asserted language rather than religion as the basis of Bengali nationhood, shook the very foundations of the idea of Pakistan, which was based on two nation theory that Hindus and Muslims constitute two separate nations. The Pakistan government's response to this rising tide uh, was the same as before. It branded the Bengali nationalists as Hindu leaning or Indian agents or anti-Islamic. Ayub Khan's governor in East Bengal, Munim Khan, revived the old Muslim League charge that Bengali is a non-Muslim language. Tagore songs were banned from Radio Pakistan and the import of books and films from West Bengal was prohibited. The attack on Bengali language and culture, however, led to a resurgence of Bengali nationalism. Tagore's birthday was celebrated with much more publicity by private organizations. As we know, Chayanot and other cultural organizations and cultural activists were in the forefront of this uh, cultural uh, struggle. Bangabandhu was finally released from prison in 1969 when Dhaka University Students Movement transformed itself into a mass movement. The students put forward an 11 point demands which included the Awamilik six points but went beyond the issue of autonomy and provided a vision for a socialist economy. Bangabandhu pledged support for the 11 points. Ayub Khan finally stepped down and a new military ruler, Yahya Khan, took over power. Yahya announced general election dates in 1970, the first to be held in Pakistan's 23-year history. Yahya also agreed to joint electorate and representation on the basis of population. Which these were the two key demands of the Bengali nationalists for a long time. Bangabandhu decided to contest the election and began to use Bengali nationalist symbols and slogans to unite the whole Bengali nation behind his demands. At a discussion meeting held on 5th December 1969 to observe the death anniversary of Sarawadi, Bangabandhu declared 
that henceforth East Pakistan would be called Bangladesh. He added that there was a time, and I'm quoting from him, there was a time when evil efforts were made to wipe out the word Bangla from our land and map. The existence of the word Bangla was found nowhere except in the Bay of Bengal. I, on behalf of the people, proclaim today that the eastern province of Pakistan will be called Bangladesh instead of East Pakistan. During the 1970 election campaign, the Awami League used posters and slogans highlighting Bengali nationalist identity. Joy Bangla became a favorite slogan. A poster stating Bangla Hindu, Bangla Muslim, Namra Shabai Bangali was widely used to project the secular values of the Awami League. In one of his campaign speeches on October 30, 1970, Bangabandhu reiterated his commitment to secularism. He said, irrespective of race and religion, everybody is equal in front of Almighty Allah. The people of the minority community are entitled to enjoy equal rights and opportunities like any other citizen. I call upon the people of the majority community to ensure the security and rights of the minority community. Again, this I found very interesting that Bangabandhu was uh, emphasizing and that he always emphasized the responsibility of the people of the majority community to uphold the rights of the minorities because it is you cannot just leave it on the state but that this that the majority community also has a uh, duty uh, and a responsibility to protect and this Again, if you read through after Bangladesh and uh, or during uh, after Pakistan, this theme appears, which I think deserves also some attention that, you know, what is the responsibility of the majority community uh, for uh, towards the minority community. The results of the 1970 general elections demonstrated the unity of the Bengali nation. The Awami League won 167 out of the 169 seats allocated to East Pakistan in the National Assembly and 288 out of 300 seats in the Provincial Assembly elections. The Pakistani rulers, however, were not prepared to abide by the election results. On March 1, 1971, Yahya Khan postponed the meeting of the National Assembly scheduled for March 3, 1971. The immediate response of the, of the Bengalis was to demand independence. On March 7, 1971, Bangabandhu delivered his historic speech where he, he, where he proclaimed, Ebare Shangram Amadir Muktir Shangram, Ebare Shangram, Shadhinatar Shangram. It is noteworthy that while he was calling upon all Bengalis to prepare for independent struggle, he cautioned them against engaging in acts of communal violence. He said, be very careful, keep in mind that the enemy has infiltrated our ranks to engage in the work of provocateurs. Whether Bengali or non-Bengali, Hindu or Muslim, all are our brothers and it is our responsibility to ensure their safety. So again, I find it is just an 18 minute speech where he, I mean, unbelievable speech where he traced the, all the history of what happened after Pakistan and all of this, but he still found this space to caution. And again, look, that ensure responsibility of the majority community to ensure the safety of the minority, that he put this responsibility on the majority community. Uh, so I think that I think as, I mean, today, I think we really need to think about uh, this. We talk about the state and this, that, government, this majority community law, key as a as, uh, uh, community organization, civil society organizations, shetar organization against uh, local communal violence, if you have to combat the local level, organization, counter organization, 
Anyway, let me continue with my uh, lecture. On March 25, 1971, the Pakistani military launched a genocidal attack on the unarmed Bengalis. And on March 26, 1971, the independence of Bangladesh was declared in the name of Bangabandhu. After a nine month long armed struggle, Bangladesh was finally liberated when on December 16, 1971, the Pakistani military surrendered to the allied forces of India and Bangladesh. The birth of Bangladesh was unprecedented as it was the first instance of a linguistic nationalist movement succeeding in creating a new state in the post-colonial era. This is also very important. Before us, no other uh, uh, linguistic nationalist movement in the post-colonial period, including Biafra, including other such movements, nobody was able to gain sovereign state status. We were the first uh, one. Let me now turn towards Bangladesh's, uh, Bangabandhu's vision in Bangladesh constitution. The proclamation of independence on April 10, 1971 began Bangladesh be a People's Republic, thus underscored the same I think it is very important that we should remember that from the beginning, we just we could have said Republic, but we said People's Republic uh, of Bangladesh. So that Pakistan, we always associated the Islamic Republic, that we are different from Pakistan. So this was uh status as people's republic but secularism in bangladesh was not meant to be a strict separation of state and region as practiced in france which is called as laicity secularism in bangladesh was defined as the state keeping a neutral position vis-a-vis -vis all religions no one religion be placed in a privileged position all religious groups are to have equal rights to practice their respective religions freely. And all citizens, irrespective of their religion, are to enjoy equal civil, political, and economic rights. Bangabandhu was a person of strong faith. He himself was a very strong practicing Muslim. And as he wrote in Amar Dakha Noyachi, he was proud of being a Muslim. He emphasized religion spiritual aspect and underscored the egalitarian, tolerant, and peaceful messages of Islam. He was against misuse of religion for furthering political and economic interests of individuals and groups. That was the rationale for prohibition of religion-based organizations by the 1972 Bangladesh Constitution. Bangabandhu elaborated his vision of secularism when he spoke in parliament on November 4, 1972, when the Bangladesh constitution was approved. He said, and I'm quoting from him, secularism does not mean atheism. We will not stop practice of religion. Muslims will practice their religion. Hindus will practice their religion. Buddhists will practice their religion. Christians will practice their religion will only object to political use of religion. For the last 25 years, we have seen oppression, exploitation, murder in the name of religion. Religion is a sacred thing. We will not allow use of sacred religion as a political instrument, end of quote. Bangladesh constitution, which became effective from December 16, 1972, adopted secularism as one of the four fundamental principles of the state. The other three principles being nationalism, democracy, and socialism. That was Article 8. The Constitution states that the principle of secularism shall be realized by the elimination of communalism in all its forms, by granting uh, the granting by the state of political status in favor of any religion, the abuse of religion for political purposes, and any discrimination against or persecution of persons practicing a particular religion. Article 27, yeah, I'm not a lawyer, but when I read this uh, part, that the state cannot grant a political status in favor of any religion, uh, I think we need to think what is our current uh, state of affairs. 
The Constitution provides for equality of all citizens before law, that is Article 27, and prohibits discrimination on grounds of religion, that is Article 28. It also prohibits a discrimination in public employment on grounds of religion, that is Article 29. The con con so not only the Constitution has a lot of articles which prohibits discrimination, but it also has articles which provides for freedom of uh, practice of all religions. For instance, Article 41 states that every citizen has the right to profess, practice, and propagate any religion, that every religious community has the right to establish, maintain, and manage its religious institutions, and no person attending educational institutions shall be required to receive religious education or take part or attend any religious ceremony or worship which, which is not his or hers. While freedom of association is permitted, the constitution prohibits formation of associations for purposes of destroying religious, social, and communal harmony or creating discrimination among citizens on the grounds of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth, or language. That is Article 38. Uh, Professor Anisul Zaman, who was closely associated with the drafting of the constitution notes in his memoirs, Bipula Prithibi, that Article 38 was specifically included in the constitution by Dr. Kamal Hussain at the request of Bangabundu, who wanted to put an end to political use of religion. In fact, Professor Anisul Zaman writes that Bangabundu called uh, Dr. Kamal Hussain and uh, Professor Anisul Zaman also went uh, with him to see Bangabundu and Bangabundu specifically asked them for two uh, articles. One, that he wants to put a stop to use of religion. So that, that part should be uh, strengthened. And also Article 70, the floor crossing. So these were, uh, which was a practicing practice in the Pakistan days, the formation of parties in parliament uh, through uh, floor crossing. So these are the two things based on Bangabundu's own experiences of living in Pakistan for 24 years, he thought that these two would be very important to put in the constitution. The adoption of secularism as a fundamental uh, principle, as well as its inclusion in various articles of the constitution made Bangladesh a pioneer amongst the South Asian states. Though India always claimed that it was following secular policies, secularism was formally adopted as a part of the Indian constitution only in 1976 through the 42nd amendment of the constitution, four years after the adoption of secularism by the Bangladesh constitution in 1972. Mm -hmm. As noted, as I noted earlier, the adoption of secularism in the constitution did not mean that the country would follow the French model of licite and, and not provide state funding to any religious institution. That is the practice of France and some of the other countries. Following the practice of India, in fact, our practice is more follows the Indian model. Following the practice of India, the Bangladesh in Bangladesh too, secularism was interpreted as the state maintaining equidistance from all religions. Indeed, Bangladesh government under Bangabundu's leadership established Islamic foundation and re uh, reorganized Madrasa ed Education Board. Again, when I was reading Amar Dekha Noyachin, I found that Bangla uh, Bangabundu uh, was quite uh, impressed with the communist government's policies of funding for rel religious institutions. He observed the progressive outlook of state-funded religious associations in China who were working towards removing misinterpretation of religious texts and practices. Unfortunately, Bangabundu did not live long enough to nurture the practice of secularism in Bangladesh. After his assassination on August 15, 1975, the two successive military rulers, Ziaur Rahman and Hussein Muhammad Irshad, deviated from the secular path, revived communal politics, and privileged Islam, practices against which Bangabundu fought all his life. Ziaur Rahman removed secularism as a guiding principle from the constitution, and Irshad made Islam a state religion. The practices of communal politics continued even after the 
overthrow of military rule and restoration of electoral democracy in 1991. However, in 2005, the High Court declared the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, which deleted secularism as illegal. In 2010, the Supreme Court upheld the High Court's decision. This paved the way for restoration of secularism in the Bangladesh Constitution. Finally, in 2011, the 15th Amendment was passed in the Parliament, which restored secularism in the Constitution, but Islam still remained as a state religion, thus leaving our position on secularism equivocal. Thank you very much.